Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, send it to me, uh, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Uh, follow us uh, on Twitter, Radio Detectives, and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. All right, well, uh, before we do get started... I uh, do want to let you know today's program is brought to you by the financial support of our listeners. And uh, I especially want to thank uh, Mary, Nicholas, Gary, William, uh, Andrea, and Gina for their support. We'll send access to our premium site, as we do with all donations of $7 or more, as well as their uh, additional thank you gifts since they uh, supported the listener support campaign. And you can still support the show at support.greatdetectives.net. Now it's time for today's episode, The Confident of Johnny Dollar, and then coming up later, it'll be an episode of Manhunt. But here now is The Confidential Matter, Part 5. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Capitan Garcia Ramulio, senor. Oh, Garcia. At the Panama Federal Police. Tell me, have senor, you... Senor, the most intensive troubles are being extended in this matter. Which means you haven't found him yet. Every man of the police is active alert. I'm happy to hear it. You may rest assured, senor, that the capture of this dangerous Americano gangster is occur at any moment. Have you found any trace of him? Senor, I wish to advise you that the entire resource of my policia is at the reposal of our good neighbor of the north. Thank you very much. Do you know where he's headed? It is only by cooperation that our two great... Garcia. Nations... Si, senor. Do you have any idea at all what's happened to Ed Morgan? No, senor. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Panama, to the Home Office, Eternity Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the confidential matter. Expense account, final page. <laughs> Item 15, a dollar and ten cents, taxi from my hotel to Plaza Bolivar in the office of Captain Garcia, Commandante of Police. It had been over an hour and a half since I'd let Ed Morgan point a gun at me and escape from the tiny fishing boat where he'd been hiding out for the past month. I'd expected the police to capture him within 30 minutes. There were only two highways out, and they'd both been blockaded immediately. But somehow, Ed, driving a stolen police car, had escaped the net. In fact, he'd done more than merely escape, as I discovered when I walked into the massive stone police headquarters. Ah, uh, Senor Dollar, pleased to sit you down. Thanks. The most surprised thing is, of course, Senor. What do you mean? You will remember you say it's a fine idea to keep watch at the hotel of the Senora Barrett. Yeah, I thought Ed might try to get in touch with bueno, her. Bueno, see. So I do this thing. I send two men, and they watch for one hour. Que bobos, they're fools. Why so? They do not see the Senor Morgan. They do not see the Senor Barrett. But only after one hour do they think to talk with the manager. You know what he say? What? Senor Morgan come five minutes before they do, and he take the Senor away in the car. What the devil for? Can sabe, Senor. Driving a stolen car and just one jump ahead of the police, and he risks his neck to go after her? Why? Pues a veces el amor le vuelve loco a un hombre. Meaning? This love is sometimes make a man crazy in the head. I'll buy that one. It's something I am not understand so good, senor. What's that? How is it you all know all about this criminal? He wasn't always a criminal, Garcia. He was one of my best friends for 12 years. Uh, then I am much sympathy with you, senor. It's too unfortunate that you are have the job for arresting. Well, I didn't know he was alive when I took the job. Que dice? The company ran an audit on his books and found an 80 grand shortage. I went to San Francisco to find out what happened to the money. 
Ed was supposedly dead at the time. We all thought so. Then I do not understand why you have come here to Panama. I came to talk to this Nicky Barrett, the woman he'd been running around with. I stumbled onto him by luck or accident or whatever you want to call it. Que curioso es la vida. To leave is like to fish, senor. When he's never certain what he may pull up on the hook. Well, I've pulled up one here and I'd like to throw it back. But I guess you don't have much choice when you're... Dispense me, por favor. Bueno. Eh? Que dice? Si, si, yo sé. Sacer del mar. Santa madre, que tan lejos. What is it, Garcia? Ay, que lastima. Si, cuidelo bien. Venemos ahorita. Si, adios. What's wrong? What's happened? Senor Morgan and the senora, they have been found. Where? They have tried to escape by the old road on the cliff. He's abandoned. Very dangerous. They are missed one bad curve and go into the ocean. Into the ocean? Si, senor. The car is under ten meters of water. There is no sign of life. Expense account item 16, $75, charter fee and one power launch. This included the services of a diver and line tender. We were just plain lucky on this one. A salvage company happened to be working in the port and had a man and equipment free at the moment. We took off along the coastline and in less than an hour we dropped anchor over the wreck. And the diver had been lowered beneath the surface. The sea was calm against the rocks. But the water wasn't clear enough to see more than just the outline of the car lying over 30 feet down on the bottom. While we waited for the diver to come back up, I glanced toward the high cliff towering above us. A month ago, there'd been another cliff like that in San Francisco. Like I say, senor, life is too strange sometimes. So is death. This man, this woman, they meet, they look one at each other, and what are they think? A lot of things, maybe. But not that they'd end up here like this. How true it is, senor. Who can ever know if one day he will come to... Wait a second. The diver's coming up. Uh, see, si. it's too bad he doesn't have the system of telephone. In this case, we can talk on the water. We didn't have time to rig it up. Well, we'll soon know, I guess. I'm most sorry for you, Senor Dollar, that your friend has to die like this. I faced the idea of his death a month ago and accepted it. Then I had to face some other things about him. Another shock now doesn't seem to have much meaning. It's just a matter of... Hey, there's the diver. He's up at the rail. Hey, let me give you a hand with that faceplate. I'll work on this side. It's very complicated, this diving business. Yeah. Well, this is kind of an old-fashioned rig. They got suits now with self-contained oxygen, independent control. Stuff the frogmen developed during and after the war. Yeah, it is. All right. There we go. All right, now, what'd you find? Oh, let me get a breath of raw air first. Oh. Better get that compressor motor fixed. Throws down more CO than oxygen. Come on, come on. How'd it look? Uh, Dollar, it's a mess. That car must have rolled over a dozen times coming down that cliff. All cracked up. Yeah, but what about... One door's half off and flattened back. All the glass is slivered. Looks like it had been bombed instead of just wrecked. Senor, is the... Yeah, the body of the woman is inside, but... There's no chance of getting it out without dropping a grappler and seeing if we can roll the car over. And the man? Is he... Nope. Just the woman. That's the only one down there. Again, the same pattern. A car plunging off a cliff into the ocean and a body missing from it. But this time I was sure it wasn't faked. Ed wouldn't have done a thing like that to Nicky. Not to Nicky. And yet his body was not in the wreck. I looked again at the high wall of the cliff, steep but not vertical. A car would have rolled and bounced coming down, as the diver had said. And one door was torn half off. The glass was smashed out. It was a possibility, as far as I could see, the only possibility. I had the captain run the launch in close. Then I jumped onto the rocks and started to climb. The slope was gentler than it had looked from the water, and the surface was broken by ravines. Clumps and thickets of tropical plants clung to the shelves, and the going was rough. A long ways from impossible. I'd made it halfway to the top when I found him, jammed in the trough of a gully. Broken, badly hurt, but still alive. Barely alive. That you, Johnny? Yeah. Easy now, Ed. Let me get a foothold here. We didn't make it, Johnny. You didn't have a chance, Ed. You should have realized. I know. Maybe I knew all along. Better not try to talk. It's kind of funny when you think about it. I mean, what happened here, just like we did it in San Francisco. Only this time it's real. 
Lost control. Yeah, this time it's real. Now, you lie still there. There are police on the road up above. We'll get some ropes down, have you out of here before you know it. Forget it, Johnny. It's no use. I'm all smashed inside. I can't even move. All right. Maybe you got a broken bone or two, but that's no reason to... Don't lie to me, Johnny. I'm dying. We both know it. Am I right or not? Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid you're right. Doesn't matter anymore. Oh, Ed. Tell me, is... Is Nikki... She's dead. No. You're right about her, Johnny. Forget it, will you? Forget it. I made her come with me in the car. Held a gun on her. She got mad. Scared. She spilled the whole story. Ed, it doesn't make any difference now. It's funny. I thought she came down here before she was supposed to. Because she just couldn't wait to join me. But she only came to get the rest of the money. She wasn't planning to stay. Listen to me, Ed. This kind of talk She won't... didn't love me. Never did. She admitted it right before we went off the cliff. But I thought she did, Johnny, for a while. And nobody else ever let me even think it. Please, Ed, why don't you try to forget about it? You know something, Johnny? What? If I was to go back, I think I'd do the same thing again. Nikki, the way she could be when she wanted to, it gets you. Got me, anyway. It's crazy. Maybe there's just no answer for a guy like me. Except this. I don't know, Ed. I'm not a judge. Kind of figures, you know. Nikki dying, too. I bought her and paid for her. I at least ought to be able to take her with me. After all, I... Easy now. The money. What's left of it? It's inside my coat. Give it to Moore. Tell him I'm sorry. Make him understand. He will, Ed. You too, Johnny. I'm... I'm sorry. I guess I don't know what else to say. Oh, forget it. But I still think I'd do it all over again. <laughs> crazy, eh? There are times we all go a little crazy. I got no right to ask, but if you would, I'd sure appreciate it. I mean, if you just shake hands with me. Oh, sure, Ed. Here you go. It's funny, I... I can't, can't find your hand. It, it's dark. I, I can't see where... Right here, Ed. Right here. Oh. I shake you ugly old son of a gun. Thanks, Johnny. Thanks for not... For not... Mm -hmm. So long, Ed. Item 17, $487.25, hotel and incidentals in Panama and transportation back to the States. Expense account total, $912.61. Am forwarding under separate cover by American Express, insured $62,112.30. End of account, end of report. Remarks? No, Mort, not on this one. Ed Morgan was my friend. The report stands. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the imperfect alibi matter. A real weirdy, where a big lie turns out to be the one real truth in the case. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. 
written by Les Crutchfield. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Jack Edwards, Russell Thorson, Thurley Mitchell, Stacey Harris, Bob Miller, Harry Bartell, Victor Perrin, and Frank Gerstler. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Hugh Bondage speaking. Welcome back. I really, uh, from a dramatic perspective, enjoyed the uh, conclusion of this series. Really, it, it showed the heart of uh, Johnny Dollar. And I think throughout the episode, really, Johnny was struggling not just with the sadness, but with a lot of anger and uh, confusion. And then he, uh, you know, when you get to the end, uh, he comes to the conclusion that whatever had happened, that Ed um, had been his friend. And I, I thought that that was, it just shows the class and the nature of Johnny Dollar as a character. So I, I thoroughly uh, thought that I thought that was a great ending for this particular serial. All right, well, listener comments and feedback, and we have this from Nicholas, uh, who donated to the show, says, Johnny Dollar has become a highlight of uh, my daily commute. Really appreciate what you do. Well, thanks so much, Nicholas. Now it's time for today's episode of Manhunt, the clue of the conflicting confessions. Manhunt, the clue of the contradicting confessions that led to Manhunt. No crime has been committed, yet. No murder has been done, yet. No manhunt has begun, yet. More coffee, Andrew. No, tastes terrible, just like the rest of the supper. Can't even cook, can you? That's enough, Uncle Andrew. You can't keep talking to my mother that way. I can talk to either of you any way I like. What can you do about it? Don't excite yourself, Andrew. You're a sick man. Don't, don't me, Tom. You're a doctor. Keep me well. Don't keep me quiet. It does me good coming out here for a visit. Just to look at the faces of my sister and her precious son. No, they hate me so. <laughs> they don't hate you, Andrew. They feel sorry for you. <laughs> you feel sorry for me. You paupers, living on my land, eating because of my charity. I said that's enough, Uncle Andrew. Why don't you do something about it, then, my dear nephew? Maybe I have. Take away these dishes. Bad enough I have to eat that food without being reminded of it. Now I want to tell you that I've decided to take back this farm. What? I expect all of you off it by next week. You can't mean that. This farm is our only means of livelihood. And starve to death for all I care. I... Uh... Oh. Andrew. Oh. Andrew, what's the matter? Oh. Tom. Tom, what's happened to him? I'm trying to find out, Molly. I don't know what's happened to him. All I know is your brother Andrew is dead. <laughs> Manhunt and the Clue of the Conflicting Confession. That of all places to get romantic in a police laboratory. Well, that's where you are all the time, isn't it, Prue? Here in your laboratory. And I guess I can get romantic here as well as any place if I like. And I like. Didn't your mother ever tell you how wrong it was to be so forward? 
Yep, he did, and Mom sure was right. It isn't doing me a bit of good. It isn't doing me a bit of good, she said. What isn't? Hello, Bill. Say, I've got a report for you on the Andrew Winters autopsy. Death by poison. And the murderer wasn't taking any chances. Fed him enough to kill a horse. Well, that's that. We finally got a murder without any mystery down here at Homicide. Winters was rich, his sister was poor, and his only relative. He was visiting her farm. Never heard of a better motive or opportunity either. Hey, come on, I'm going to show you something. Such as what? Such as an old-fashioned detective sergeant getting results in an old-fashioned murder. Uh, Winter's sister, Molly Barton, is in my office. Oh? I better have a murder confession in an hour. Want to come? Okay. Uh, see you later, Pat. All right. You've been pretty smart when a murder was tricky, Mr. Drew Stevens. Now I want you to see a cop wrapping up a case in an hour. All right, Bill. I'm an agreeable guy. Come on in. And remember, I said I'd have a confession in an hour. Oh. Oh. Don't get so jumpy, Mrs. Barton. I just want you to tell Mr. Stevens here what you just told me. There's nothing to tell. I I poisoned my brother. It's unkind to speak ill of the dead, but he was the meanest man in the whole world. He deserved to die. How did you do it, Mrs. Barton? And when? While I was preparing supper last night, I put some insect powder that we use on the farm into his food. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the poison we found all right, though. Insecticide. I don't care what you do with me. I alone am responsible for my brother's death. I poisoned him, and I'm glad I did. See, Drew, what did I tell you? Confession within an hour. I'll get it. Morton speaking, homicide. I'm sorry, Mrs. Yeah. Barton. Do you realize uh-huh. what your confession means? Yes, I do. I wish I could say I'm sorry. Wait a minute. But I'm not. Hey, Drew. Uh-huh? Pick up that extension phone on the corner. Uh-huh. I want you to hear something. Uh, you, Mrs. Barton, wait out in that office then. All right. This one here? Yeah. I'll pick up the phone, Drew. Okay. I've got it. Listen to this. Hello? I'm still here. I want you to repeat what you just told me. Very well. My name is John Barton. My mother and I worked the farm where Andrew Winters was found dead this morning. I want to tell you that I'm responsible for his death. I murdered him. Bill, ask him how he did it. Okay. How did you murder Winters, Barton? I poisoned him with the insect killer we keep for our plants. I just called to tell you I'm coming down to give myself up. Goodbye. Well, you heard it. What do you think? I think you're doing very well, Bill. You not only got one confession to a murder in an hour, as you promised, you have two confessions. Ooh, so what? They both were in on it, mother and son. I'll pin it on both of them. Say, look, there's a doctor in this case, isn't there? The one that had dinner at the Barton Farm last night? Sure, Dr. Morton. He's still at the Barton farm. Lives there most of the time. Mm-hmm. He brought Mrs. Barton into the world. He was her best friend. Okay. It might be an idea for you and I to go up and see him. What for? We got two confessions to the murder. As soon as young Barton gets here, this case is closed. Ah, uh, you know we've got to have evidence, Bill. We need a sample of that insecticide poison. Might look at the farm, too. Find out what grew there. Find out what grew there, he says. I'll go, but I don't have to find out what they raised on the Barton farm. They grew murderers, Drew. Murderers. You don't sound like you had any love for Andrew Winters, Dr. Morgan. There's no reason why I should sound any other way. He was the meanest, most vile-tempered, cruelest individual I've ever known. I treated him from time to time. In fact, it may interest you to know he was about to write to the state board, accusing me of malpractice. That's a pretty damaging admission, considering that he was murdered, Dr. Morgan. It doesn't really matter how damaging it is. You see, I poisoned him. What? Another one? You killed Andrew Winters, too? Yes. While we were eating, I excused myself from the table, walked out to the shed where the Bartons keep their insecticide, got a little of it, and put it in Winters' coffee without anyone seeing it. Well, you're batting wonderfully, Bill. That makes three confessions. So what's the difference? They were all in on it. I don't know what that means exactly, but if it implies there was anyone else involved, that's not true. On my professional word of honor, I poisoned Andrew Winters myself without the knowledge or help of anyone else. That's fine. It's only fair to tell you a few more things. First, that Andrew Winters was a very sick man. He couldn't have lived six months. For the past two years, he's been in continuous pain. You're not building a mercy killing angle, are you, Doctor? The word mercy and Andrew Winters should never be spoken together. Well, let's get downtown. 
You coming, Drew? No, I'm going to stick around this farm a bit. Uh, tell Pat to drive up here when you get back, will you, Bill? All right, I'll tell him. But first, I'm going to have her go out and rent Madison Square Garden so we can hold all the people who are confessing they murdered Andrew Winters. All right, all right, Pat, I'm coming. Oh, well, it's about time. So, this is the place where Winters was murdered. And what have you been doing? Spring planting? Come in, come in, Pat, and stop making those bad jokes. All right. And now, suppose you tell me why I'm here. Romantic reason? You wouldn't know better than that, Pat. We're working. Oh. Yeah, come here with me, I want to show you something. Mm-hmm. We know Andrew Winters arrived up here yesterday afternoon at 4.30 to spend a week at this farm, right? Right. Now, he got here at 4.30 yesterday afternoon. Mm-hmm. Yes, this was his room. Come on in. All right. You've always wanted to be a detective, Pat. I want to show you something. Here. This is the bag Winters brought with him. I'll open it for you. There. Look inside. All right, I'm looking. Oh, it's just a well-packed bag. Now, we know that for all his cruelty, Winters was a scrupulously clean man. Anything missing in his bag? Well, I'm not exactly experienced in men's traveling bags, but it looks like he brought enough stuff for a week. Mm-hmm. Notice anything else? Mm, no. You will. Here, take a look at this. Winter's wallet. Mm-hmm. Remember, he was a cheap, miserly individual. Look inside. Okay. Just a lot of money and a couple of identification cards. Remember, he came down here from quite a distance. Do you notice anything missing now? No. Nope. You will, very shortly. And now, Pat, you and I are going back to headquarters to add another confession to the three Bill already has. Are you kidding? Another one? Who? Mine, Pat, dear. I've got to go back and confess what up until now has been a serious bit of overlooking the facts on my part. The three of you are in cahoots. Everyone is guilty. I don't know what you're trying to do with those individual confessions, but it won't work. I'll pin this winter's murder on all of you. I don't think you will, Bill. Get out of here, Drew. I'm busy. I'm going to make these three admit that we're working together on the winter's murder. I've got to repeat, Bill. I don't think you will. You don't think I will, he says. Why not? Because there wasn't any murder. No, no. You're going to tell me Winters ain't dead? Oh, no. He's very dead, Bill. But, Drew, please. These people confess they poisoned him. Yes, they poisoned him, all right, but they didn't kill him. Let me tell you all what actually happened. First, Winters, who was a spotlessly neat man, and who was supposed to stay a week, didn't bring a single extra shirt or a pair of pajamas with him in his belief. Well, what? Well, we knew he was going to be murdered. That's ridiculous. He couldn't have known. Next, Winters was a penny-pinching individual. When I looked in his wallet, I found he hadn't bought a return ticket on the train. Yeah? Well, that means he never expected to come back. Because by buying the return transportation, he could have saved ten dollars. I still say he expected to be murdered, and that's the reason. No, Bill, that isn't the reason. Dr. Morgan, Winters came to the farm at 4.30. Supper was served at 6 o'clock, and he was dead at 6.30, right? That's correct. Bill, take a look at this report I just got from the medical examiner. Yeah? It says the poison we found in Winters took at least two hours to work, regardless of the quantity used. Well, who cares about that? I do. You see, it was all I needed to prove a thought I had. Dr. Morgan will tell you that Winters was living in agony and on borrowed time. He wanted to die. But he was so downright mean, he wanted somebody to be blamed for it. So? So he went to the farm. And the minute he got there at 4.30, he swallowed some of that insect poison, knowing we'd find it in him after he had died and blamed the Barton. They poisoned him, all right, but at 6 o'clock. An hour and a half after he had poisoned himself. You mean to tell me that all of these three people did feed that guy poison? And I got three confessions? And still no murderer? Uh, Not today, Bill. All you've got is what is known as a first-rate suicide of a third-rate scoundrel. Welcome back. Well, I actually found this a solid episode. It's certainly not original premises, but, you know, we don't necessarily need those on this show. Um, I, I thought it was well done. The only thing was Bill again wanting to show, um... Uh, to show Drew something that wasn't extraordinary. You know, I want to show you how a police officer can solve a case if the criminal comes in and confesses. 
Um, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, in my mind, I'm making a list of the, uh, police officers, uh, portrayed in radio, like as the fictional foils to detectives. And if Drew didn't work for the police himself, I think that, uh, Bill would have ranked a little bit towards the bottom. Uh, but other than that, I thought it was a decent, uh, puzzle mystery and, uh, a little bit of a different spin. If you recall, we had a similar case over on, um, Mr. Malone a few weeks back and, uh, just kind of, uh, went in entirely, this one went in an entirely different direction. All right, well, now we have some more listener comments. Mark uh, has a comment regarding Cairo. I lived in Cairo in 1999. Places like the Tambourine are few and far between 50 years after the airing of this episode. The Quran forbids the consumption of alcohol. Therefore, its availability is was limited to big hotels, fancy restaurants, and the back markets. By the way, the Quran doesn't mention cigarettes, so they are all over the place. Also, a thousand Egyptian pounds equaling $5,000 may have been true in 1949, but today it's about $144. Well, how times have changed, and I appreciate the update. And I guess that does kind of address, uh, I remember one listener said that, you know, he wanted to go and see, you know, Rocky Jordan's, uh, Cairo, and yeah, uh, that city such as it was, you know, doesn't currently uh, exist in that form. Though th- there have been a lot of changes in Egypt, and if someone has a more, even more recent uh, perspective, we'll always uh, love to hear from you on that. Linda, who donated earlier, she sent along an email, says, Since I was a little girl, I've watched black and white movies with my father, Columbo and Quincy with my mother, and read Agatha Christie and Sherlock Holmes on my own. My taste which I am sharing with my daughters, have not changed much since then. My older daughter likes to hunch over, pretend to grab a door handle, turn around and say, and another thing in a gravelly voice to imitate Peter Falk's method of disarming the baddie, just to nail him with an astute questions. Your great detectives of old-time radio podcast have been a delightful addition to my list of enjoyable pastimes, and now my husbands and daughters are accustomed to seeing me get absorbed in the mysteries and often chuckling at your comments, which are heartfelt and on the money without ever being mean-spirited. The fact that you have a wide variety of programs means there is something for everyone, and I sometimes will... uh, fast from listening for a week or two so I can binge listen when I have a few hours to myself. So thank you for your dedication and insights and for making me feel as if I'm chit-chatting with a like-minded friend, not to mention a true gentleman, every time I listen. Well, thanks so much, Linda. I appreciate your comment. And, you know, I when I was uh, young, I watched a lot more uh, television and mysteries. I tend to watch a lot less and I've, I, when I was growing up, I liked what I saw of Quincy, but I, t- and I look forward to someday sitting down and just going through that whole series. But the way it is now is I tend to choose just, you know, one or two, one or two uh, mystery shows I'm, uh, going through and limit myself to that. But I've definitely appreciated what I've seen of Quincy. And I look forward to the time when we get through with some other, uh, projects and processes when I can go ahead and sit down and uh, see some more. Uh, appreciate your comment and appreciate you listening. And Gina just says, uh, thank you for this wonderful program. All right, well, that will do it for today. Uh, Manhunt will not be back next week uh, because we only have four parts of next week's Johnny Dollar. So Man- uh, Manhunt will return in two weeks. Johnny Dollar will be back on Monday, and then on Friday of next week, we'll wrap up uh, next week's story. And on Wednesday, we will actually be playing a program called Here, Here Comes McBride, starring Frank Lovejoy. In the meantime, if you have a comment, please send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter, Radio Detectives, and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.